Folks, a very good morning. Welcome to you. It's good to be here. Good to see you on this chilly Sunday morning. My name's Grant. I'm one of the elders here at Lansing, at, sorry, Lansing, Worthing Tab. Wrong church. I'll get there in the end. Folks, just a couple of um, notices. Babs just wanted to pass on her thanks to everybody for all the cards and all the kind words that, that um, you have been sending her. She has been greatly appreciated by that. Uh, so thank you. Also, folks, um, Baptisms, if anybody's interested in baptisms, anybody's being interested in being baptized, um, maybe the Lord is stirring something on your heart uh, for that, uh, please speak to, to Rich and Steve. Um, we're planning that baptismal, baptismal service on Easter Sunday. Um, Tony, in fact, where's Tony? Oh, he's way up there. He's got a long way to come. Uh, just a reminder, also, Easter, um, our evening service as well, uh, just as Tony makes his way down here. Evening service tonight, 6 o'clock, come along to that. We're currently going through Jonah. Are we looking at Jonah or a topic? Rich? Miracles and science, folks. There we go. Come along to that. That should be interesting. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Thanks. Uh, uh, good morning. <laughs> I think Grant just wanted me to remind you that there's a meeting straight after the service um, in the church hall. Just grab a coffee or a tea and come through. It's fine if children come with you, no problem. It's just for those who think they may be interested in supporting the, uh, the Tab Cafe project by being able to, to serve in the cafe um, for between two or four hours on a weekly basis. Uh, so if you think it might be you, and if you think you're willing to help with that, 
Uh, whether you're a church member or not, you're welcome to come through and uh, we're just going to have a short meeting and just see if anybody wants to um, indicate that they're willing to make a, a commitment to that. That's it, really. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tony. Well, folks, as we begin our service, Isaiah 35, uh, that prophecy about Jesus, both his first and second coming, one of these now but not yet prophecies. Um, we're going to be looking at it, opening it up a bit more a little bit later on in our sermon. But Isaiah 35 says, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf and stopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals, where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there, and that shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, it shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's stand and sing together, folks. Faith is 
morning. How are y'all? Doing good? Maybe? Yes? Okay. If I could have all the kids come up front and just sit right here, just so that it's easier to chat. Perfect. Just where I wanted you. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about space. Does anyone think space is cool? Do we like space? Daniel thinks space is cool? So at night, if it's nighttime and you're looking up in the sky, what are you going to see? A A what? A bed. Oh, oh, at nighttime. Yeah, you're right. You know what? You're correct. But if you're outside and you look up into the night sky, what else will we see? see stars. You see stars. Anything? Anything else? Shooting star. Have you seen some before? They're hard to see. One day you will. Really? The moon. Perfect. Have you ever seen? Have you ever stepped outside and just seen planets? Yes. Have you have you seen planets? You saw Jupiter. I saw Jupiter Mars. Yes, Emma. Meteors. Oh, you're seeing some crazy stuff, and that's amazing. One more. The fire one. The sun? <laughs> right. So at night, you can see a lot of things. If you could go ahead and put up the first slide for me, Ruth. So these are the planets that you can see with the naked eye. That means you have nothing helping you. These are the ones that you can see at night. Of course, it has to be the right time of year. It has to be a clear night. You have to be in the right place. They're not very easy to see. In fact, you really can't see them in this picture, to be honest. Um, and really, they kind of blend in like stars by the naked eye. You might see a little bit of a color different. Mars might be a little more red or whatever. Mars, Mars is written, yeah. Um, so it's very hard to see, but, but um, I believe it's Uranus and Neptune and Pluto, which I'm going to include today because I'm feeling nice. Um, you cannot see, it's impossible to see them by the naked eye. These planets you can see with the naked eye, but those planets you can't. So if we can't see those planets by the naked eye, how do we know that they exist? Yes, so... It's impossible to see them on our own by the naked eye. You can't see those planets. You have to have something more powerful to help you see those planets. So with a telescope, you can go to the next one. Look how much easier it is to see. They're beautiful. You can see the detail. And because technology has advanced, we have really good cameras and telescopes. We can see things like this. And you can go to the next one. So much easier to see, right, than the first picture. And then if you go to the last one, we can even see these planets, and we can see them in really good detail because we have something more powerful than our vision to be able to see them. So today, in the story that the adults are going to be hearing, we're going to be learning about a man who was born deaf and with a speech impediment. And he really, really wanted to be healed. He was desperate to be healed, but there was nothing that he could do on his own in order to be healed. It wasn't something that a doctor could help with or, you know, good exercise or a good diet. There's nothing that he could do on his own. But fortunately for him, he met Jesus. And because that man had faith and Jesus had mercy on him and Jesus is far more powerful, he was able to heal this man. Um, it wasn't something he could do on his own, but with the help of Jesus. And so sometimes in our lives, we might face stuff that we feel is impossible, um, whether that's at school or at home or um, a health with your health, and you need something that's more powerful than yourself in those situations. And we have the option to look to Jesus and ask him to come in those situations um, and to help us. So I'm going to read a, a scripture really quick from Ephesians 3.20 that says this, 
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for listening. You can go sit down. just as we remain standing and before the children go out. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come to you wherever we are, whatever it is we're doing, knowing that you are faithful and good, and to all your promises there is a yes, that you hear us. Lord, that you even came to us when we were far away from you, when we were running away from you. You came to us, you died for us, and you rose again. And as the children go out, please be with them, Lord. Bless them, bless their time. May they be edified and built up and we pray that you would begin a good work in each one of them, a work that you will bring to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As the children go out, turn to someone, say hello. Let us come to a time of prayer. Let us pray.
Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, we thank you that although you are the king of all and you are a mighty judge, you are also our loving Heavenly Father. We thank you for the grace and mercy that you show us day by day. We give thanks, Lord Jesus, that you came down out of your glory and lived on earth. That you were willing to sacrifice yourself for our sins. That you died on the cross and rose again, defeating sin and death. And Lord, at this time we come before you confessing that we have failed you, that we have sinned against you and against our fellow man in thought, word and deed. And Father, we repent of our sins and we ask for your forgiveness through the blood of your Son, our Saviour. And Lord, we turn away from those sins and we ask, Father, that you will help us to live lives that are witnesses to you and in accordance with your will. And we give thanks that you have sent your Holy Spirit to dwell upon us, to give us strength and understanding, to help us to live lives that are worthy and acceptable to you. Not through our own strength, but through the strength that you give us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this world in which you have placed us. So often we look round and see the terrible effects of sin. But we know, Lord, that you are raising up your people in many lands. And we ask that you will give them strength. We particularly lift to you those who are persecuted. Those who know that to share your gospel puts their lives in danger. We thank you that by your spirit you give them strength, you give them courage and therefore Lord that your church is growing even where there is this oppression. We acknowledge, Lord, that there are many parts of our world in which there is hatred and bloodshed, greed, and where people suffer because of other people's sins. Lord, we ask that you will raise up your church in every land, that your gospel may be proclaimed, and that people may turn to you and recognise that you are Lord of all. We lift to you those in authority, those who you have allowed to have power and government. Father, we ask that throughout this world, government leaders may learn to recognise that they are only there because you have allowed it, and that one day they will stand before you and answer for what they do. We ask, Lord, that your Spirit may be upon them now and cause them to see alternative ways of government, that they may seek peace where there is currently war, that they may learn to provide for their people where currently their greed causes famine. Father, we just ask for a moving of your spirit through the world and that we may see changes that are not brought to man out by man's hatred and fear. Father, we lift our own land before you. We bring to you those in authority. We lift to you his majesty the king and we ask, Lord, that your healing hand will be upon him that he may know your loving presence and your grace and mercy at this time and be with those in government and in opposition. Father, they have been given great power and authority. 
And we ask, Lord, that by your Spirit you will cause them to use it wisely and to recognise your Lordship. We bring to you the Church in this land, those who accept you as Lord and Saviour. We ask, Father, that you will build it up that you will raise strong leaders who proclaim your gospel without fear or favour, that your church may once more be there for that purpose, to bring others to you. And we thank you for this church here at the Tabernacle. We thank you that you have brought us together as your family in this place. And we ask that you will help us to serve you. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather today. And we ask that you will be with Grant, that you will help us to hear the message that you have given him for us. Open our hearts and minds to receive your word. We thank you, Lord, for all the others who take part in the service and make it so that we can gather and worship you. We ask your blessing on us and we give thanks, Lord, for the offerings that are given week by week, month by month through the offering or through standing orders or other payments. And we ask, Lord, that you will use them for the proclamation of your kingdom. And we ask now your blessing on us in this time together. In your holy name. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing one more time. Amazing grace, my chains are gone.
Hello again. Um, today we're in Mark, oh yeah, Mark 7, 24, um, which is going to be page 1016 in the Pew Bible, if your Bible is the same as my Pew Bible. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and after spitting touched his tongue and looked up to heaven. <clears throat> he sighed and said to him, At Fatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged him to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we have just sung of your amazing grace shown to us wretches. We praise you for that. But we ask now that by that same grace, you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and give me the words, the words to say, that what we do this morning would be, would be pleasing to you and edifying to us. And this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, every, every culture has its taboos. Some of them cause serious offense, while others provoke, um, simply provoke some sort of, of, of mockery. And I guess even in our local church, church here um, this morning, there is a whole range of cultures represented, each with its own taboos. And what is hard is when people go out of their way to deliberately break taboos. You often find it in the arts world or even in the music industry. People doing it just for effect, just to get views and likes. For some, I guess it's almost a, a badge of honor to be a taboo breaker. And as we read the Gospels, we find him, Jesus himself was a taboo breaker, which is a significant part of our passage this morning. He was prepared to break taboos in order to reach those who found themselves on the wrong side of taboos. And what we see this morning is two episodes. Two people who learn a great deal about themselves and above all about the Lord Jesus. And the first episode is about a woman. She's got a possessed daughter. And I have called this the faith for a miracle. The faith for a miracle. And the context for this message is, is last week we, we saw that Jesus went onto the offensive. If you remember, he went onto the front foot with the religious leaders of his day, and he was challenging their, their, their religious hypocrisy. They completely misunderstood what makes somebody unclean. Food doesn't make somebody unclean. It's what's in the heart. 
That's why Mark adds that little bit in the end of verse 19, that little bit in brackets there, um, thus he declared all foods clean. Now, that had far-reaching implications, apart from the fact that it really wound up the Pharisees. You see, one of the reasons for all the purity laws was to teach a vital spiritual lesson for God's Israelites. If you, if you are to follow the God of the Bible, then you may have to make a stand for him in your life. A stand which makes it clear to all that you're not following the ways of the world, a world that is living in, in rebellion against God. You had to show that you were set apart for God. That's what holiness is. And this meant that the Jews sought to, uh, sought to distinguish themselves from all non-Jews around them by what they ate and wouldn't eat, and who they spent their time with. Not eating certain foods was a boundary marker. It was a sign of whose side you were on. And the Pharisees had followed that religious, religiously, but tragically, dangerously, they had added to it. Added to these laws that changed the whole purpose to the laws in the first place and in so doing had become ungodly and hypocritical. They had actually forgotten that even though the people were to separate from Gentiles, the non-Jews, that God still had a purpose for the Gentiles. That actually God is a global God. He has got a purpose for the whole world. And that is why Mark opens this section in verse 24 with quite deliberate wording. Maybe you didn't pick it up first time, but listen to this. From there, he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. That was Gentile territory. And Jesus knew what was at stake. No wonder he wanted to keep it quiet in the first place. You see the second part of verse 1? And he entered a house, uh, sorry, not verse 1, verse 24. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Jesus was doing what he knew would horrify the Pharisees when they found out. Now maybe when you heard the passage read, I don't know, but you found Jesus' attitude to this woman is very disturbing. He's almost rude to her. But the truth is, the fact that he was having a conversation with her at all was shocking by itself. That was the shock. Not, the, not his apparent rudeness. It was shocking on at least two counts. Firstly, she is a Gentile. Mark has gone to great pains to make that clear. Verse 24, we have seen, we're in the region of Tyre, a Gentile area. Then verse 26, Mark, Mark is laying it on thick there. She's a Greek, born in Syria, Phoenicia, by birth, by culture, by location. She is a Gentile. But secondly, she was a woman. For Jesus, a single Jewish man, publicly associating with a woman, let alone a Gentile woman, well, that would have been an outrage. She knew that she had none of the religious, social, moral credentials necessary to approach a Jewish rabbi. And yet, though she was a Gentile, though she was a woman, not a man, her daughter had an unclean spirit. In other words, though she knew she was unclean in every way, and therefore disqualified, according to the religious respectability of the day, disqualified from approaching a moral religious person, she didn't care. She just goes in without an invitation. And we and we told that she fell down and begged. That word beg there is sort of the present progressive. So she just kept on begging and begging and begging. In the parallel account in, in Matthew's gospel, the disciples have to tell Jesus to tell her to go away because she's just going on and on and on and on. Nothing would stop her. Why is she so bold? Well, if you think about it, there, there are... There are cowards and there are heroes. There's everybody else in between. But then there are parents. Parents are not on that spectrum. If, you're, if your child is going over a cliff, you're going to do whatever it takes. 
Your character, your personality is irrelevant. You do whatever it takes, and therefore it is not surprising that this desperate mother is willing to break all the barriers. And we need to understand Jesus' strange words as acting as a sort of filter. He is testing her sincerity, testing to see how much she understands, seeing what she actually believes. Did she see him as one of, the, one of these other hundreds of, of Greek so-called miracle healers at the time? Was she, was she just coming to him just like he was anyone else? And his language in verse 27 is stern, isn't it? And he said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs, which is pretty insulting. I mean, we, we, we live in a canine-loving society. Just on the way here this morning, the number of people taking their dogs out for a walk. But they did not. In those days, most dogs were wild dogs, and they were scavengers. And to call someone a dog was a terrible insult. Anywhere in the Bible where you see a dog mentioned, it's, it's normally as an insult. Goliath says, Do you, am I a dog that you come, with me with st- to, come to me with sticks and stones? So, so dog is not good. Worse than that, the Gentiles were often called dogs by the Jews because they were so unclean. So this, is this just an insult? Is this an insult? Well, no, it's actually a parable. It's a short parable, but it's a parable all the same. Because I wonder if you notice the chink uh, chink of light in what Jesus said. There is a chink here. He's testing her. And it comes in that little word, first. See it there? First, let the children eat. She's a mother. She can understand that children, at first the children need to eat, and then the dogs get the scraps, the crumbs. But also in the context of the parable, the children were presumably God's people, the Jews. They had priority as God's chosen people. But there is a hint of leftovers for others. And this courageous woman goes for it. Verse 28, she answered him, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And that clinched the deal. Jesus was impressed. He says to her, verse 29 there, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your child, your daughter. Now you see, this is is not the case of this woman having quick wit. She knew she had no legitimate claim on Jesus. He was the Jewish rabbi. Messiah, even if she had gotten that far. She knew that actually she didn't belong. She's not supposed to be at the table. She knew that she was entirely dependent upon his mercy and his kindness. And by apparently accepting the title of Gentile dog, hers was no false humility, but a genuine realization that Jews took precedence over Gentiles, but not exclusively so. You see, what is remarkable is her realization that this precedence was not exclusive. Gentiles still get a look in. The dogs still get to eat from the table. There is more than enough on the table for the whole world. She still has a place, and Jesus is still interested. Because, of course, they always did have a place in God's plans. His concern has always been for all peoples on earth, going all the way to the promises he gave to Abraham in Genesis 12 and before. But many of Jesus' contemporaries, of course, had had lost sight of that completely. But this remarkable mother had not. She had great faith in Jesus as, as the solution to this terrible problem. There is nothing more agonizing than seeing a child in pain. And hers is a story that has echoed down the centuries. And it is especially for us who do not come from a Jewish background, and my, and my guess is that's probably most of us here this morning. We are Gentile dogs. 
who before Jesus came were excluded from the full benefits of the old covenant, unless, of course, we were prepared to become culturally Jewish. And there is a wonderful little memorial to this woman's faith in the Book of Common Prayer and the communion service the liturgy includes a prayer called the prayer of humble access, and we're going to use this later on when we come to, to, to receive communion. But it begins like this. It says, we, not, we do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table. You see what the prayer, this prayer does? It combines both the recognition of our needy status before God and this woman's amazing faith that comes to Jesus in the first place. And so the prayer continues, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. That is what he is like. That is the point. And ultimately at the cross, which of course what the communion celebrates, and so also here Jesus responds in mercy through a seemingly effortless miracle. I mean, he, he drives out the girl's demon just as if it was a, was a click of his fingers. The demon is not even there. He, he doesn't arm wrestle it. He just wills it to happen, and, and he just wills it to be, and it happens. You know, what did you do this morning? Oh, well, you know, I did the school run, picked up a coffee and a pastry, answered a few emails, did some doom scrolling, uh, cast out a demon, took the dog for a walk. Now, that's not making light of, of, of miracles, but that is how simple it is for Jesus. What strikes me and what makes this miracle stand out is not so much the exorcism itself, because, of course, that wasn't unusual. Mark's gospel, although short, tells us of a number of exorcisms. So that is not the key thing here. What was special was this woman's faith. No one else had anything like that before. Which raises the crucial question, how on earth could she grasp even at a hint of the truth about Jesus? How did she get it? How could she know that he was God's pioneer, the first prepared to feed a Gentile like her with the crumbs from God's bread to the Jews? Where does that sort of faith come from? I'd suggest it's nothing short of a miracle. Mark gives us a big clue in the next episode in Jesus' ministry. We have had the faith for a miracle, but secondly, we have the miracle of faith. We've had the faith for a miracle. Secondly, we have the miracle of faith. We see verse 31 as it goes on. Jesus moves out of Tyre, the, the Tyre area, and then goes down to the region of the Decapolis, another Gentile territory. This time, Mark doesn't tell us about the deaf man's nationality. We, we, we know next to nothing uh, about him, except that he was in a pretty poor state. Deaf with a, a serious a speech impediment, as we can see in verse 32. And, and I guess life would have been hard in what would have been an age that, was, that wasn't so understanding and, and sympathetic. No care workers, no NHS, no occupational therapists. I suspect some might have thought of him as demon-possessed. Now, the interesting thing is, here is the first time in Mark's gospel we have a deaf healing. And I wonder if you notice that the whole rigmarole Jesus goes through to perform it. He puts his finger in the man's ear, he spits, he, he, he touches his tongue, he, he looks up to heaven, clearly indicating that it's coming from God. He groans, he calls out some strange Aramaic word, I mean, this is very different to the previous episode, where he hardly did anything. This is, this is not magic. This is not expecto patrimon expelliarmus. I had to Google that, by the way. Bearing in mind, the man is deaf. Right? So just speaking to him, well, the man's not going to hear. Touch, he can relate to. So firstly, Jesus, Jesus is meeting this man where he is at. This is Jesus being the wonderful counselor. Jesus is using, you could say, he's using sign language. 
Also, he takes the man to a quiet place. I mean, the man had probably been a spectacle all his life. Jesus didn't want to make more of that. But secondly, what we must assume also is that Mark wants to draw close attention to this. In, in the whole book, it has enormous significance, and it sheds light on the events immediately before and after it. Chapter 4, you remember the famous parable of the soils. Remember how often the idea of hearing comes up. And the, and the final group hear the word, and vitally they accept it. And Jesus says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, of course, hearing the word and responding to it is only possible if you're not deaf. And Jesus has prepared us for the, for the fact that many would reject him because they couldn't accept the word that they, that they heard from him. They were deaf to it. The shock is that even Jewish religious leaders fall into the category, as we saw last week. Even those who should have known better, even those with titles in front of their names and thrones to sit on in the synagogue. They didn't hear. And yet back in chapter 7, a woman, no less, a Gentile woman, she gets it. She heard and believed. And she accepted, uh, 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 and Jesus accepted her faith as genuine. Mark has recorded the healing of the deaf man next to the exorcism of this woman's daughter for a reason. In other words, showing that the only way she could have believed was as a result of Jesus' miracle, not a physical healing, but a spiritual healing. She was deaf, but now, she, but now, she, but now could believe because she could hear. And the exact same thing happens in the next chapter in Mark 8, if you look further on, except in reverse, this time with a, with, a, with a sight miracle. So if you put the two chapters side by side, basically in chapter 7, you have a Gentile woman who has amazing faith, followed by a deaf and dumb man who, who is healed. That's chapter 7. In chapter 8, a blind man is healed, also in a very strange way, in a strange situation. And then immediately after that, you have Peter recognizing that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, God's king, although he doesn't get it completely. He can't quite handle the idea that God's king must die on a cross. But he gets that he is the king. He has the sort of beginnings, the first stage of a two-phase two process. He sees... I think the combination of sight and hearing and speech miracles should be no surprise to us for anyone who knows the book of Isaiah. Jesus actually quoted Isaiah in last week's passage, and Isaiah clearly lurks in the background of this passage. But just quickly before we jump there, something which is very significant, and you'll see now in a minute. The word in verse 32 there is a unique word. If you look at verse 32 of our reading, speech impediment. It, it's the Greek word mogilaulos. Sounds like a cool name for a pet. But here it means speech impediment. And it occurs nowhere else in the New Testament except in this story and the parallel account in Matthew 15. Nowhere else in the New Testament. And the word mogilaulos occurs only one time in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So if you have your Bibles, turn back with me to Isaiah 35. Those eagle eyes among us will know that we, we, we opened up our service by reading Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35, see verse 6. It says there, Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute, the mogilaulos, sing for joy. Now, understand what is going on here in Isaiah. Isaiah 34, just before that, is called Judgment of the Nations. So if you look at, look at Isaiah 34, draw near, O nations, to hear and give attention, O peoples. Let the earth hear and all that, is, that fills it the world and all that comes from it, for the Lord is enraged against all the nations and furious against all, the, all their hosts. He has devoted them to destruction, has given them over to slaughter. 
All right, so this judgment on the nations. So chapter 34 is, is a very dire chapter. The nations are judged by the righteous judge. He's going to lay them low. He's going to destroy them. This is a prophecy of the Lord's judgment upon the wicked. And then Isaiah 35, chapter 35, the mood completely flips. Notice that. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God with, will come with vengeance, with the recompense. Just by the way, that's, that's, that's not saying that God will come bringing vengeance, bringing recompense. It's saying that God will come to bear vengeance, to bear recompense, so that he will save. See, that's that, that end part there. Then the, verse 5, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute, the mogi laulos, sing for joy. Chapter 35 is, is a remarkable description, not only seeing into the future, when the exiles would return to Israel, but even bigger than this, a vision of the future coming kingdom. So the bleak picture of 34 is completely reversed in chapter 35, so that you have streams of living water, and you have abundance, and you have prosperity, and there is no danger, and there are no predators, and the lame shall leap for joy, and the blind will see, and the mogi lalos will speak, because God will come. Only time in the whole Old Testament this word is used. The only time outside of this New Testament story that this word is used. Jesus is clearly putting himself right in the middle of this prophecy in Isaiah 35. I am the one who will bring the glory of Lebanon, of Tyre and Sidon. I am the one to usher in this new kingdom. So understand what the miracles are about. They are about a new day that has come to God's people. The beginning of this day, and, and, and your life may sometimes feel like an Isaiah 34 life. But Jesus is telling you, you are in the Isaiah 35 life. Now I know it's not all there, more is coming. But with Jesus, he has opened up this new day, and the miracles tell us about who Jesus is. That is what will happen when God's servant comes. Hearing to the deaf sight to the blind and the people who saw what jesus was up to in chapter 7 back to chapter 7 you can see it at the end of 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 the chapter verses 36 and 37 that they are amazed they're overwhelmed with amazement he has done everything well they say he even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak but i guess what people were slow on the on the uptake about was the fact that these physical healings pointed to a spiritual healing. Because you see, the faith to believe in God is itself a gift from God. How else could it be possible? How else would it be possible to see something so extraordinary as what this anxious mother sees in Jesus? Now, perhaps that worries you. And, and, and I should point out that there is mystery here. There is mystery here. But what we can be clear about is, is, is though the fact that faith is a gift from God should, should never be an excuse for not believing. Sometimes you hear people say that, you know, far too often do, do you see it's, it's not a case of I can't believe, but I won't believe. And if it isn't, then just say, well, Lord, help me to believe. Just because I don't believe now, that doesn't mean that God won't give me the gift at some point. So, you know, why not try asking him for it? But still, if faith, is Jesus is, but if faith in Jesus is a gift from Jesus, how does it work? When the Lord first drew me to himself back in many years ago, 1987 it was or something, I didn't fully understand what that actually meant at the time. But I can see now as I look back over the years, I can see that I was not acting alone. As I look back at, the at that day until today, that God was, was and is at work every step of the way. 
He brought people into my life. He put me into a local church that preached Jesus from the scriptures, and it was done verse by verse every Sunday. He gave me friends, and above all, at some point, he opened my eyes, he opened my ears, and I couldn't have done that by myself. I can't take any credit for any of my Christian life. It's all a gift. So it's both trusting Jesus is what I wanted to do, but it was also what God enabled me to do. An illustration that helps me to live with that is to imagine, imagine a big arch. I mean, we've got, I've got one just above me here, so you can imagine it there. And, and imagine that along the top of, of, of the arch are these great words from, of Jesus from Mark 1. The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Go on, turn to him, repent and believe. Basically, two descriptions of the same thing. Stop trusting yourself. Start trusting Jesus. Start trusting him to rescue and forgive. Start trusting him to deal with the problem of the human heart. And when you do, you walk through that triumphal arch. But once you do so, you look back. And you see on the other, other side inscribed these words from the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, because faith is the gift of God. Two sides of the same experience. But of course, how could it be any other way? How could it be otherwise? How could we even think that we can save ourselves by doing a few religious things? We, we, we see it in last week's passage. I cannot turn over a new leaf and just try to be better. I need nothing less than a heart transplant. I need radical surgery, which is precisely what Jesus offers. He has proved he can by doing what Isaiah's long-awaited Messiah, servant king, would do, opening blind eyes, healing deaf ears, and not only does Jesus diagnose our heart sickness, he provides the cure. And as our passage has shown, he offers this for all. He offers this for all, not just the Jews, but the Gentiles as well. Not just the religious types, but for people who'd never darken the doors of a church. People who don't think they are good enough. And actually, it's harder for the religious types because they think that they are good enough. They simply don't see they're not. They assume that a little bit of tinkering here and there is all that is required. It's far harder for a religious person to accept their need for a heart transplant than it is for someone who knows their need. But it doesn't matter who you are or where you are from or what you have done, or who your friends are, or what your skills are. Mark 7 surely proves that. Anyone, we're all in the same boat as far as the state of our heart is concerned. But thankfully, because it is his nature to have mercy, Jesus is not fussy about who he associates with. Even if, it, if that means breaking a lot of taboos because do you see he is both the Lord of all and he is the Lord for all let's pray he has done everything well he even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak Lord Jesus we are amazed by your power, but also your mercy. And what a powerful combination those are. We are amazed that you use your power to bring mercy to those who have nothing, who are outside, who are beyond the taboos, who have no hope. We are amazed that you show your mercy even to people like us, and we praise you for that and praise you for all that you have done because it is all very good. And we pray that we might live lives that show the same mercy and love to all we meet.
for your glory's sake. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing together and respond with, with Jesus. Thank you. Folks, we are fallen creatures. We're not worthy to stand before a holy God, yet God is merciful. We are sinners. God is merciful. We are sinners, but God is merciful. And what we have here is a, a picture, a symbol, um, is to remember the cross that, that we are, where we are seeing the ultimate child of God who was cast out from the table without a crumb, so that we could be brought in, we could be adopted in. The child had to become a dog, an outsider, so that we who are dogs, so to speak, could be adopted 
and brought him and made sons and daughters of the living God. We're going to have that prayer come up in a minute on the screen. We're going to say it together. But let me read first of all. Folks, draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We pray together. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's give thanks now for the bread. Heavenly Father, thank you now for the life of Jesus. We thank you for everything he has done for us. We thank you that he gave us this symbol to remind us that he has opened the way that we who were once his enemies, once on the outside, can now be seated at his table. And now by taking and eating, we feast by faith on Christ. So as we do this, Lord, feed our hearts and our souls as we take this bread within, May we take Christ deep within our hearts. We thank you for this, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us eat together. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's give thanks now for the cup. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for giving us your Son, the great gift that you have given to us. We thank you now that as we drink this cup, we remember his blood that was shed for us on the cross. We thank you for the cleansing work from the blood of Jesus, taking away all sin. Lord, as we drink this cup now, we pray that you would bless us with the reality of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us drink together. continue in a time of prayer. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy and goodness towards us. <clears throat> we thank you that we have such a friend in Jesus who opens the way for us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who opens our blind eyes and our deaf ears and gives us the words of praise and thanksgiving to you. Thank you that we can come to you bringing all of our needs, all of our longings, and you will always hear us. Just in the quiet now, maybe you want to bring someone 
to the Lord in prayer, someone who may be in need, someone you may know, family member, friend. Let's do that now. Father, we pray now for Father, we pray for Babs and Barbara as they mourn the loss of a loved one. Draw near to them, comfort them. May they know and treasure your everlasting peace. We thank you that you are the God of comfort, even during this difficult times for them. May they rejoice in the gospel with the new life to come. We pray too for Joyce Dyer as she holds on to life in this world. We pray that you would relieve her of any pain or discomfort. But thank you for the hope that she has of the life to come. A life where she will be free from all frailty. Where she will have a new resurrected body. A life with Jesus for eternity. Father, we pray too for Danny Rice, as he returns to work this week after having some time off, draw near to him, strengthen him, give him renewed vigor. Father, we pray too for those in our, our congregation who are perhaps struggling with sin. We pray that they would appreciate more and more the emptiness and illogicality of continuing to live in sin. As they are tempted, may they look forward with excitement to being perfected in Christ and living free from temptations in the new creation. Father, we pray too for those seeking to or thinking about being baptized here on Easter Sunday. We pray that you would stir their hearts, stir their hearts to come forward and to say, yes, I want to take that next step. I want to publicly show the cleansing that Jesus has done in my life. So Lord, please, we pray for them. We pray for all these people whom we have brought to you now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, let's stand together and close our time by singing, by, singing, by faith we see the hand of God. Let's stand and sing together.
spirit to the Lord. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen.